Coming up on DTNS, Spotify can't hear the laughter anymore. DoorDash hires employees and how to run an online store in a perpetual supply chain nightmare. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, December 6th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Sarah Lane's out today, but we have Brian Brushwood, co-host of Cord Killers, master of the modern rogue, and so much more. How's it going, Brian? And I, I'm doing great. I just feel like I, I, I should bring cats or something. <laughs> bring cats? Yeah, or some kind of pets. I don't know. Yeah, it's a very pet-filled uh, cast we, we have here, but it's fine. It's fine. You're our guest. You can do whatever you want. Uh, if you'd like to hear more of Brian and I talking, there's a longer version of this show called Good Day Internet. You can get that at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons that helped make that possible, including Chris Benito, Steve Iadarola, and Dan Kolbeck. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Last week, Twitter updated its privacy information policy to ban sharing photos or videos of private individuals without consent. The company acknowledged since then that it mistakenly suspended about 12 accounts under this policy, mistakenly citing coordinated and malicious reporting targeting anti-extremism researchers and journalists. Twitter spokesperson said a dozen erroneous suspensions occurred and that the company launched an internal review to ensure that the rule is used as intended in the future. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office sent Clearview AI a notice of allowance for its patent on methods of providing information about a person based on facial recognition, including its automated web crawler, which scans the Internet for photos of faces and then tries to match them to a database. This notice means the patent will be approved once Clearview pays the administrative fees to do so, which it's expected to do. Alibaba will reorganize its e-commerce business into two units focused on international and domestic, the Chinese market, respectively. The International Digital Commerce Unit will include AliExpress, Alibaba.com, and its Southeast Asian e-commerce business, Lazada. The domestic, China-focused unit will include Tmall and Taobao. According to documents reviewed by Bloomberg, Sony plans to launch a subscription service codenamed Spartacus to compete with x Gutbox Game Pass, expected to launch this spring. The service would merge Sony's existing PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now services, with Sony keeping the PlayStation Plus branding. While not finalized, Sony plans three tiers for the service, a base tier with existing PlayStation Plus benefits, a second tier with a larger game catalog that might eventually include access to PS5 games, and a third tier with extended demos, game streaming, and access to a library of classic games that goes all the way back to the first PlayStation station. Finally, WhatsApp rolled out support for ephemeral messaging as the default for all conversations. You can you can switch that now. Up till now, this had to be set for each conversation. Now you can just make it the default every time. Users also have more options for when conversations disappear with 24-hour and 90-day options added to the existing 7-day period. All right, let's talk about the laughter going away from Spotify. Uh, if you tuned into Spotify today in the mood to laugh from your favorite comedian, you might have been disappointed. Spotify removed the work of hundreds of comedians while it works out a royalty agreement for paying for the writing of jokes on its service. It was already paying for the performances. Uh, but this means a lot of big-name comedians, John Mulaney, Kevin Hart, Jim Gaffigan, Tiffany Haddish, Martin Berbelia, they're all not on Spotify right now. Global rights administration company Spoken Giants is leading the effort to get paid composition rights for jokes, no matter who's telling them, right? This is the writing, not the performance. The heart of the issue is that comedians up till now are paid for performances, but not necessarily for the writing, kind of like they're getting paid to do covers of their own work rather than for the copyright on the jokes themselves. Comedians would rather be treated the same as musicians, where the right for the performance is a separate right from the right of the composition, even if the same person wrote the song and performs it. You got two different rights. While focusing on comedians right now, Spoken Giants hopes to expand this across podcasts, speeches, and lectures. Spoken Giants reached out to streaming services as well as radio providers back in the spring of this year. One of the elements to be decided, in Spotify's case anyway, is whether it has to have a new agreement for composition and therefore pay additional money or whether it can take its existing agreement and what it already pays and say, oh, a portion of this, we were paying for both rights, we just didn't divide the, the payments, we'll allocate some to writers. Spotify notified Spoken Giants on November 24th that it was gonna remove the works 
uh, if they couldn't reach an agreement. And today is the day they removed them because they couldn't reach an agreement. Uh, Brian, you know, from one perspective, it's I I think what has happened here is comedians are like, oh, we didn't used to care because nobody played comedy on radio, but now lots of people are listening to comedy. Well, keep in mind, they always cared, and they cared very, very deeply. Uh, if there's one group that cares more about theft of the general idea of a thing than comedians, it's magicians. There are, there are stories of magicians who would go on stage and smash the props of other magicians because when it comes to magic and comedy, think about it, the heart of a good joke is surprise. And that is a thing that you can copyright the uh, the words you could trademark a gizmo or a, a patent. You could patent a gizmo and so on, but you can't capture the heart of a joke. And so instead, both comedians and magicians have had to rely on a form of self-policing, basically shaming people who violate that social norm. Uh, the most famous example on the internet was when uh, Joe Rogan called out uh, Carlos Mencia for ripping off a bunch of material or whatever. This sounds like trying to take a structure that that maybe made sense in the world of music, but I just don't see it working in the world of comedy. And if it does, prepare for an endless police state of everybody saying like, yeah, but the joke is that he's really tall. And, you know, I kind of made that joke. I, I took this less as I want to protect others from stealing, because you're right, there's already a culture around that, to saying there's always been a copyright on the composition of a joke versus the performance, right? And I, uh, Kevin Hart, uh, always get paid for both. And then Spoken Giants came in and said, I don't know, read that agreement with Spotify closely. I think you're just getting paid for the performance. And comedians were like, huh, I think you're right. We should have a part of that contract that pays me specifically for the writing of the joke, even if I'm the one performing it, just like if I wrote a song, I get paid for the song writing as well as the performance. So it's Kevin Hart saying, I want to be treated like Taylor Swift. I, I want to get paid for my writing of my joke as well as my performance separately. So you, here's the deal with the devil that you do not want to make if you are Kevin Hart, because uh, Taylor Swift, as, as we're learning as she re-records all of her own music, uh, is subject to what's called an automatic copyright, which means that other people are automatically allowed to cover her work as long as the automatic royalty is paid. So you're telling me that Kevin Hart could come out with a brand new special and I can set up a webcam and say the entire thing word for word, put it up on Spotify and only pay an automatic royalty. This sounds like a disaster in the making. I understand why they're doing it. I think it's a bad idea. Yeah, I, I, and I think probably the breakdown with Spotify is Spotify saying, look, in the previous world, recorded comedy was not a big revenue maker. Comedians made most of their money touring. Uh, you didn't have a, you didn't have a lot of comedy radio stations out there, which is why we didn't have a separate right. That's the world we made this agreement in. We get it that there's a lot more comedy being paid, but I think Spotify's argument is we're already paying you what it's worth. Now you're trying to squeeze the extra money out of it. And I think that's why Spotify is like, we can redefine it. So the same pot is being divided up differently, you know, especially for those cases where there's a, a writer, which often happens like, you know, for, for late night television and stuff, where there's a writer separate uh, from, from the, the performer. But uh, Spotify doesn't want to pay any more money. It's not like they're suddenly making more on comedy. So I, I think that's... Uh, that's the dis disconnect here, and 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 Spotify is trying to call Spoken Giants bluff on it. I don't even want to contemplate this coming for podcasting. Yeah, from from the comedian's perspective, uh, what more money? Yes, double pay I'm for, for writing it. and performance. But then yeah. I'm telling you, the poison pill is now you're subject to automatic royalties. All right, folks. Last week, uh, we 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 gave you the heads up. Uh, 15 minute delivery, fast delivery of groceries and such coming to the United States. It's big in, in parts of Asia already, uh, even taking over parts of Europe and South America, uh, Latin America, and New York seems to be the, the grounds for it reaching the United States. We talked about Instacart last week, and uh, now DoorDash uh, has announced it's going to hire dozens of full-time employees. Actually, some of them are part-time, but they're full employees. These are not gig workers. Uh, to beat Instacart to the punch in New York. DoorDash hired dozens of full-time employees as couriers for its 15-minute convenience store item 
delivery service. So this is bodega stuff. Uh, they're going to start just in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan. Employees will be stocking and managing DoorDash owned and operated Dash Mart convenience stores. Uh, they'll be given e-bikes from Zumo uh, for deliveries. And DoorDash is looking into how to possibly offer this service for non-DoorDash bodegas. For, but right now it's, it's for their own stock. Like fast delivery services that already exist in Manhattan, like Gorillas, Joker, and Bike, uh, these DoorDash employees are full-time. They get workers' compensation and health insurance benefits. And if they're part-time, they get offered the same health insurance benefits as, as gig workers uh, do. DoorDash plans to expand the service to several areas around New York City. Once they get New York City covered, then they might uh, try to expand to other cities. But um, fast 15-minute or less delivery, Brian. Would you like it? Tom, would I be a bad person if I responded by simply saying, I don't believe a word of this. I believe that yes, DoorDash wants to know what everybody wants to hear. And I believe that DoorDash, yes, has hired full, uh, full employees that they intend to send people out. And I believe that yes, there'll be a bunch of stories of things getting there in 15 minutes. Do I believe in the middle of this supply chain crisis that they're going to keep this promise in the long term? I'll give you an answer. Do I believe D Domino's is willing to deliver in an hour or less or my pizza is free anymore? No, I do not. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, uh, I don't have any of these services available here. I know in Singapore, Seoul, Tokyo, uh, Hong Kong, and I, I'm, I'm sure there's a dozen other cities I, I could mention if I, if I was well more well-informed, have had these services for years, have had these sh services. But the key to all of those cities that I just mentioned, they're very dense urban areas, right? Where you can have a location near thousands, if not tens of thousands of people that are legitimately five to 10 minutes away. So 15 minutes is a luxury. Um, I think the supply chain aspect is more about the selection of like, hey, everything we have is available in 15 minutes. Everything we have is a comb and some Listerine, but they're <laughs> both available in 15 minutes. Like that could, that could be a factor here for sure. We're gonna talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but I, I do think they can do the 15 minute delivery service. The big question is, can you make it pay? Like well, you could correct. do it, but can you make it profitable? And also, you know, how quickly do you add that asterisk that says, unless there's traffic, uh, unless there's weather, unless there's literally any excuse that you didn't make it in 15 minutes, I, that's the part that makes me raise an eyebrow. Well, and especially when you start talking about less dense areas, when you're talking about Austin, when you're talking about Los Angeles, uh, you know, where it's like, well, okay, I, now I have the, the Dash convenience store or the Instacart uh, location, and, but instead of being near 1,000 or 10,000 people, it's near 500 people, 300 people. So I either have to expand my radius and then run into traffic problems uh, or not offer it. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. Why do we need DoorDash? We got Gus. Who's Gus? He's my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you just drones. What? What? You get Zipline involved in this, and they can just deliver your Listerine and your burrito by drone, right? And then you don't have to worry <laughs> I wanna, about it. I want to hear the doorbell ring and open it up and see somebody covered in sweat, exhausted, holding a burrito and some Listerine, <laughs> gasping for air. <laughs> it's 14 minutes, 45 seconds. Here you go. <laughs> Uh, a few weeks ago, you may remember that a group of cryptocurrency enthusiasts tried to band together to buy a copy of the United States Constitution that was on sale. Uh, they lost the bid to somebody who uh, was a single bidder and is going to put it uh, in a museum. But what you may or may not have noticed is that the group set up a DAO. It was called Constitution DAO. Uh, DAO central stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. The DAOs have been around for a few years and they're very popular in the cryptocurrency world. The idea of a DAO or a DAO is to form an organization with no central leader, no hierarchy, no executives. It just runs on top of cryptocurrency and gives members their rights within the DAO. So the organization could employ people so I guess you could have executives in a sense, but you're not talking about C-level executives. You're not talking about board members. You buy tokens in the DAO, which represent your voting rights. One of the promises is that you could then sell those tokens in the future for more than you paid for them, of course, which is why people are very interested in DAOs. But there's also this decentralized aspect of it. Rules are enforced by smart contracts and decisions are transparently recorded on the blockchain for all to see. That means... 
Anybody can join or leave the organization very easily. No third parties are needed for financial transactions, escrow, et cetera. Like I said, you don't need a board of directors that tries to represent the investor's interest. Every investor can represent their own interest. The most easy to grasp reasons for running a DAO are probably cryptocurrency itself. Members of the DAO get to vote on the direction of the currency, whether it should fork, what the gas fees should be, that kind of thing. But DAOs are also being used for social groups, even some things like bake sales and stuff, uh, media organizations, somebody's trying to talent agency with a DAO. There's plenty of research and investing and other organizations. It does seem like niche organizations are the most common, but it can also work well where a small group of investors would use a DAO to decide how to invest the pool of money. Instead of talking it out themselves, they can just do votes on the blockchain. In May, in fact, Jenny DAO acquired the NFT for an original song by Steve Aoki and Three Lao, which makes all the members of Jenny Dow co-owners of the song. Uh, this is one of those NFTs that actually gives you some rights in the song. Proponents say it brings more transparency and inclusiveness than just an LLC. Detractors say, well, there's nothing in a DAO you can't do without a DAO, uh, and point out that DAOs might sometimes be illegal, depending on what country you're in. In July, the United States uh, uh, state of Wyoming passed a law letting people form an LLC with a DAO, uh, the best of both worlds, although a lot of DAOs in any state register as an LLC anyway, often in Delaware, and just define the LLC as delegating a lot of the coordinating and voting rights to the DAO. Like with most crypto products over the years, they exist in a gray area. Uh, they can easily be abused by bad actors, but there's a potential for having tools to make administering organizations, large and small, a lot easier. Brian, what do you think of this? As a magician, I applaud their squirreliness. Uh, I always love weaselly ways to work around um, heavy-handed legislation. You know, let's say the problem in the early 1900s is that uh, everybody got lost their shirt in the stock market. So you decide that only accredited investors, people who have a net worth of $1.5 million or make over a quarter million dollars a year, are allowed to speculate in certain types of stocks. So what happens? Somebody creates a virtual entity that you're buying into. You get to Mar uh, Robin Hood, where you're able to trade on margin, even though you don't qualify for all that stuff. Uh, what, what's the problem? We want to have a protectionist racket for a taxi cab. So we're going to sell medallions. How do you get around it? Uber comes along and you just go right around it. So uh, in, in, in that regard, um, I don't know. It, it, it just makes me, it leaves me feeling like lawyers going to law and then people are going to people. And, and this is yet another case of the same dang thing. I, I feel like this is a little bit of a, another one of the, I think you're right. It's the same. It's a, it's another like, Hey, we're trying to weigh around the law. I do think there's something valuable, kind of the way blockchain has proven to be way more valuable to businesses than cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, the jury's still out on, seems to be getting a, a little more viable every day. But lots of people are looking at blockchains and saying, ah, there's something we can use, maybe just internally in our in our own organization, because of the decentralized, you know, hard to change way uh, that it exists. I think DAOs right now are in that soup where we're kind of just seeing what'll come out of it. People are trying all kinds of things, some of them fraudulent, some of them genius. And out of that soup will emerge a few models that people will be able to say like, oh, well, we wouldn't change our whole organization to a DAO, but those aspects would be way more efficient. Just the way f FinTech is, is saying, gosh, three days to settle a transaction, but if we use a blockchain, it could be instant. Yeah, maybe we should take that part of cryptocurrency. I think that might happen with DAOs. I mean, which is really an indicator that we just keep seeing the same echoes of the same problems. There's a uh, Wild West. Is somebody tries to settle it, a new Wild West is invented. Yeah. You, you get a general store that eventually becomes Amazon. Yes. Uh, only it's run by a, a cursing uh, Shakespearean actor named Al Swearingen. <laughs> uh, join in the conversation in our Discord, folks. Uh, you can join that by linking your Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. <laughs> All right, we talk about supply chain all the time, especially regarding uh, chips, but also the logistics problems of getting things shipped, containers. We, we talked to Big Jim a few months back about this whole thing and, and why it's causing a problem. We have a good understanding, I think, at this point, what and where the problems are. Uh, but what about having to run your business in this new world of, of supply chain and logistics problems? Brian, 
does that and for the past two years has had to deal uh, with these very issues and the constantly changing nature of them, starting with last year's holiday season, because holiday seasons are always where you, you make or break any kind of store, really. Uh, what happened with your store last year? And, and then take us through what you learned and what you're doing this year. Sure. Uh, for those who don't know, I run a little online store called uh, scamstuff.com. We call it Gear for the Modern Rogue. It's uh, spy gadgets, magic tricks, uh, some puzzle boxes. Uh, it's a curated collection of clever stuff. And, and what that means is some of them are originals that we can go across town and get printed and then made into a booklet or what have you. Others of them, we need ingredients that we ship in either from uh, 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 domestic or, or international suppliers. And then others are straight up things that we create bundles from international suppliers. And last year was the first year that we kind of got caught on a wares. Um, uh, every year we come out with a new puzzle box and a original deck of cards. And then just for some reason, our puzzle box guy was late, 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 so late that all of a sudden we realized, oh, we're not gonna make it in time for Christmas, but we have to make Christmas work for everyone. And so we uh, had the idea of like, okay, uh, why don't we open it up for pre-sales and people can for you know check an option of would you like a card saying this is your gift and we have a nice card signed saying you're getting a puzzle box this year for everybody who year after year bought the uh, the, the the next in the series um it felt really awful doing that because there's an amount of trust between a consumer and a producer and i was accustomed to i don't know walmart letting me down or target letting me down sure. or whatever I was less accustomed this year when I made it all the way through checkout for, I, I finally, after like three years, I bought a new iPhone and I made it all the way to the end with the impression that Apple was going to ship it in two to three days. And then, and then they, uh, uh, the receipt comes and it says, psych, uh, one and a half months. And so it was when that happened that I realized, oh wait, I believe that a lot of people are about to get very, very angry with this tune. I think we're all tired of that, that same tune. And we made the very challenging decision to refuse to sell anything that we didn't have in stock, which as I'm saying these words, sounds extraordinary and stupid. And I think our bottom line will reflect that it was extraordinary and stupid, but, but uh, man, I found it so painful last year to have to make excuses and keep in mind, last year, we shut down the store three weeks before Christmas because we didn't want to take orders that we couldn't absolutely guarantee. So this year, we uh, we uh, have a list called things that are still in stock. And it's it's truly frightening because there's, there's still things that we're waiting on that we had expected to have weeks ago. Uh, and so we're trying to, we're sort of in a low grade perpetual emergency mode. And the biggest things, uh, that we've learned are constant communication. Never tell a lie. Never, never act like you're going to have something. Never make a promise that you can't keep. If you can't keep a promise, then don't tell them how it's going to be. Ask the consumer what will make things right. Uh, and for us, part of that has been whenever the, there's been a pre-order, every week we've reached out with like a, hey, here's the Monday morning mystery memo where we're going to tell you the latest of how many of the mystery box items we got, how many of them are going to go. And uh, in the case of the mystery box, it took like three and a half months to get everybody their stuff. But because it was a constant conversation, uh, uh, general satisfaction was uh, fantastic. Um, I'm not going to pretend that every store has that as an option, but I know for being a very, very little guy, uh, it's been instrumental to keep us afloat. I think uh, some folks in our audience may may go, well, hold on, Brian. You 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 make uh, make it sound like having the thing in stock when I order is a revelation. Shouldn't every store have the thing before they sell it to me? Can you explain a little about why why that flow happens usually? Well, I have been a champion of so-called just-in-time management. I believe that is uh, an efficient and healthy thing to do. Uh, when when just-in-time management supply chains break down, as is happening now, when you what you often see is people placing bets and placing bets is always going to be less efficient than, than managing the flow of things. And I was shocked. There was, um, I, I, th I think it was a New York times article talking about a woman who had a small shoe shop and she, she had to guess how many shoes she was going to have. So there's a photo in front of her with a bunch of shoes 
top comments were, can't believe she's hoarding all these shoes. <laughs> and it's like, I'm sorry, isn't that what that means to say you have stock in an item? It's it's right. very, it's a peculiar time. And, and I don't have a strong uh, a, a, a assessment of whether it's right or wrong, but uh, but boy, uh, the supply chain thing is real. And, and I can tell you for a fact that nobody should be believing anybody uh, on anything uh, except for me except for me. <laughs> well, right, because you're only telling them what actually you can ship them uh, right now. But the, the idea with just-in-time inventory, though, is it's faster for everybody, right? If I order a thing that you don't have yet, but you know you'll get it in time to turn around and ship it, that's faster than if I order a thing and you don't have it and you say, sorry, I can't take your order, or okay, you're ordering it, but I don't have it yet, so I'm going to tell you three weeks, and then, oh, wait, you'll get it faster, which, of course, people are happy when you get it faster, but then they might not order it if it's going to take three weeks when they would have, if it was going to take two days. So when it works, like you said, it's it's efficient and great for everybody. Uh, and, but when all the containers back up and it can't work anymore, it causes problems. Well, and, and it's not a matter of it not working so much as in the long term. It certainly is the most efficient strategy. However, it does mean that in the short terms, you get weird things like everybody gets worried about toilet paper. Remember that moment we had a toilet yeah, paper yeah. shortage? I don't have any trouble getting toilet paper now. There yeah. are hiccups and bumps along the way, and I, and I still am a champion of it. But boy, is it inconvenient to try to run a business that depends on just-in-time management right yeah. at, this, at this point. It, but what I've been saying about it is it turns out uh, that just-in-time management is only good until a once-in-a-century event happens and uh, ruins the entire global shipping chain. So every time that happens, just-in-time management is going to get thrown out of whack. Uh, yeah, but also, you know, hey, uh, just if you're worried about it, if you want to become a crazy hoarding everything person who lives in the in the uh, the hills of Austin, just remember there are other things that use just in time management, like your liver and heart and lungs and <laughs> all of your organs rely on just in just in time management. Yeah, it's why you eat, actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, hey, uh, well, uh, good luck, and and I think the upside is. Uh, your your approach this year means that there might always be something new. You never know. Go Tell check. What, there's a it's it's certainly an exciting time because I had hoped that right now I could announce a thing that we would definitely have in our hands by Christmas. It turns out tomorrow might be the day that I can announce a thing. But until then, these lips are sealed. <laughs> gotcha. I gotcha. do not want the pain and misery of making a promise I can't keep. Check back tomorrow, folks. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Eric reported from the front lines of robot delivery. Uh, he said, you mentioned Neuro operating deliveries out of 7-Eleven and Mountain View. I happen to live very near there. And upon hearing this, I knew it was clearly Slurpee time. Uh, Eric says that about 20 minutes after ordering with Neuro in the app, the car pulled up slowly. I opened the back passenger side door and there was a cooler bag with the order inside. With the safety driver there, which is the way they're rolling this out at first, it doesn't feel very real, but you can see how they transition from this normal-ish car to something like a larger version of Starship's robo-coolers in the future. The car also made the strange decision of going against their stated mode of operation by pulling into my complex's parking lot, which is technically on maps, but rather poorly, and it seemed to get stuck for a few minutes while trying to leave. I'm not sure if the human had to give it a nudge, but I'll give it the benefit of the doubt and assume it had the brains to navigate a few hundred feet of clear pavement on its own, and it eventually did go. Thank you, Eric, uh, for the frontline report on Neuro uh, Last Mile Deliveries. Keep those emails coming, folks. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. We got lots of great emails this weekend. Only got time for that one right now, uh, but we read them all and appreciate them. Also, thanks to our brand new bosses, Carlos Lasso. Amber Antoinette Ford, Nina and Andrew Bartlett, and Norman Lacoste. They all just started backing us on Patreon. So thank you, Carlos, Amber Antoinette, Nina, Andrew, and Norman. Uh, good to have brand new bosses. And uh, now's the time, folks. Uh, join up. Get, get a little holiday cheer in your life because we'll, we'll thank you right here on the show. We also want to thank Brian Brushwood, man. Thank you so much uh, for helping us kind of understand that end of things. We hear a lot from the other ends, uh, but, it, but it was good to hear the, the boots on the ground report. 
Yeah, dude, I got religion real fast about under-promising and over-delivering. Speaking of which, I have a gift for everybody. Go find World's Greatest Con Season 1. It came out this year. We just found out a few days ago that we were in the top 50 of all most subscribed podcasts on Pocket Casts. We're so, so proud of it. It's me, Justin Robert Young. Um, uh, it's a really, really, really good show. Uh, please give it a listen. Yeah, it's another example of Justin time inventory i see what in you this case do. justin robert young uh yeah go check it out folks it is very very good we are live monday through friday 4 30 p.m eastern 21 30 utc find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live back tomorrow with iaz Actar. talk to you then Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>